Ancient Rome is a civilization that arguably gave rise to Western civilization as we know it. Well, them and the Greeks, I guess. And that has inspired future generations for well over 2,000 years. If you're a history nerd, it's somewhat difficult not to be at least somewhat fascinated by Rome and its achievements. But even if you're not into history, you probably still know something about the Romans. From their effective military, to their often crazy emperors, to their brutal gladiatorial fights, to the life of ancient luxury they lived in, we all know something about the Romans. Of course, since their civilization peaked thousands of years ago, we also have a ton of misconceptions about the Romans, which I will try to bring to light in this video. Let's begin with what's perhaps the most famous piece of Roman clothing, the toga. Togas were large pieces of cloth folded around the wearer's body over a tunic and circular in shape, much like your bedsheets when you're trying to adjust them at 3 in the morning. Togas were heavily inspired by the Etruscan Tabenna, and were a common sight in ancient Rome. Which leads to our first misconception, togas were worn all the time. As undeniably fashionable as they most certainly were, saying Romans wore togas all the time would be like future historians saying the ancient Americans always weren't around wearing two-piece suits. Which I can confirm is not remotely the case. In reality, much like modern two-piece suits, togas were actually more like ancient Roman business suits and formal wear. And of course, only citizens were allowed to wear them, as it was a sign of citizenship. And also, at least after the 2nd century BC, it was generally men who wore them. Roman fashion was quite varied though. Aside from the generic tunic available to most Romans, citizen women also wore stoli as formal wear. Similar in many ways to the toga, stoli were modest garments joined together by brooches and pins called fibulae, and generally worn with a cloak overhead known as apala. Next, myth. All Greco-Roman statues were unpainted, plain, blank, white. Plenty of others have already made good videos all about this, but there's loads of archaeological evidence to support that Roman statues were actually vibrantly colored in various lifelike shades, as opposed to the minimalist style that we see today. This misconception, however, dates back to the Renaissance. And spoilers, this period of European history is kind of where a lot of our misconceptions of ancient Rome come from where the artists of the time seemed to embrace the seemingly pure qualities of the blank white marble, and so sculpted their own sculptures in this style. However, even famous Greco-Roman buildings like the Parthenon were vividly colored, with its colors faintly visible into the 18th century. One thing Greek and Roman statues often depicted were their gods. The Romans had a whole pantheon, pun not intended, of gods remarkably similar to the pantheon of gods worshipped on the next peninsula over. In fact, this has led to the misconception that Rome stole their gods from the Greeks. Kind of like the original version of the Can I Copy Your Homework meme. But did they not? What was all their different parallels? This is not a simple question to answer, but in short, the Romans didn't just plagiarize all the Greek gods and give them Latin names. Rather, it is thought that both mythologies stem from the even more ancient Proto-Indo-European mythology, a common ancestor to both mythologies as shown linguistically in how Deus Pater gave rise to both Zeopater and Jupiter, all terms roughly meaning Skyfather, and then later on the Romans adopted many of the characteristics of the Greek gods into their pantheon. So it wasn't like this, it was more like this and then this. So the Greek pantheon did influence the Roman pantheon, but the Romans didn't just copy the Greeks' homework. Now of course I mostly focus on geographical, historical, and cultural stuff, and thus I'm not really as much of a mythology guy. Though of course it's also worth pointing out that the Romans also did this for the mythologies of other colonized people as well. This was a phenomenon called religious syncretism, and Rome did this all over the place. Though of course it happened a little bit more with the Greeks because of how much influence Greece had over Rome. If any piece of Rome's massive legacy has survived in popular culture to this day, one such piece must be the gladiatorial fights a brutal blood sport pitting two heavily armed opponents against one another, in which losing gladiators always died. I've had a video about this subject in the pipeline for a long time, but in short, this also has something to do with another misconception. Gladiators were always slaves or prisoners. While many of the gladiators were indeed slaves forced to fight for entertainment, or prisoners who were really just there to be executed, Gladiators were often looked at in much the same way as modern sports stars are seen today, 
as major celebrities who even had their own sponsors. In addition, although it's thought that the sport first started as slaves fighting to the death as part of their former master's funeral, things of course had to be tweaked a little bit by the time it became so popular that a giant amphitheater towering over all its surroundings was built right in the middle of the capital city for it. Gladiators weren't just slaves with overly dramatized armor, they were also often volunteers. And either way, they were skillfully trained for years on end. So, in short, if they were to be killed every single time they lost a match, all that time and money spent on training would have essentially been for nothing. Also, you'd have probably run out of gladiators pretty quickly. So aside from some particular special events, gladiators, slaves or freed, were generally not killed in the arena. It did happen, just not nearly as often as it does in the movies. Okay, let's finish this off with a couple more in rapid fire. Obviously, as I covered in my recent video on ancient languages, Roman Latin sounded very different from the Latin used today by the Catholic Church. C's were always pronounced K, H was actually pronounced, instead of getting the silent treatment like in Romance languages today, J didn't exist, it was actually just an I, and V didn't actually exist as a letter, so all the V's you see on Roman inscriptions are actually U's. Thus, Veni Vidi Wiki, as said by Julius Caesar whose last words almost certainly weren't et tu brute? No one knows for sure what he actually said. Second century historian Suetonius states he said nothing at all. Meanwhile, others say he actually said the Greek phrase kaisu tegnon, roughly meaning and you, child, since Roman patricians often spoke with one another in the more refined Greek. Shakespeare just converted it into Latin, since his contemporary audience would have been more familiar with Latin than Greek. In fact, et tu brute? wasn't even Kaiser's last line in the play. His actual last line was, Then fall Kaiser. So, yeah, that's about 0.2% of all the misconceptions we have about this fascinating civilization that we've made over the years. Although, let's be fair, it has been thousands of years. Also, come on, who hasn't made a mistake in history class? Regardless, what I hope you at least take from this video is that togas weren't always worn all the time, Greco-Roman statues were generally brightly colored, though there were some exceptions. Saying Rome plagiarized the Greek gods is disingenuous, and maybe a little rude. Gladiators did die in the arena, just not nearly as much as in the movies. And Shakespeare was writing fiction, not historical accounts. Thanks for watching. If you want to help out the channel, do consider supporting the channel on Patreon, maybe check out some of the merch we have on sale, and if you don't have the money to do so, no worries, even just liking, sharing, or subscribing can go a long way in helping out the channel. And also to help you learn something new every Sunday. Yeah, that. Yeah, the catchphrase.